I almost dropped it. Hey y'all, I'm JP. Thank you for joining me today as I compare and rank The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett to the 1993 movie adaptation of The Secret Garden to the 2020 remake of the adaptation of The Secret Garden. If you don't yet know about my devised point system for comparing books to movies, or if you need a refresher, you can check out this video, which was made for just such a purpose. And remember to assign your own points as we go. Let's look at theme, which I've really been using in place of genre, but I'm learning. Unfortunately, for my point system, not for the stories, they're all children's lit slash coming of age genre, so I'm just going to read their summaries and pick the one that sounds most interesting. This is the secret garden, mysterious, walled, and locked. The center of Frances Hodgson Burnett's beautiful and moving story of a lonely, willful little girl and how she finds friends, health, and happiness when she comes to live in a great house on the Yorkshire Moors. It makes me wish I found this book when I was a kid. It's a very whimsical description, which I like. When a young girl is sent to live with her uncle after the death of her parents, his manner and sorrow leaves her feeling bitterly alone. Neglected once again, she begins exploring the estate and discovers a garden that has become hidden and, aided by one of the servant's boys, begins restoring it to its former glory. Not really feeling the whimsy in that one. Lots of sorrow and neglect. When Mary Lennox's parents suddenly die, she is sent to live with her uncle, Archibald Craven, on his remote country estate deep in the Yorkshire Moors. While exploring, she discovers a hidden magical garden. That's kind of clinical. My point obviously goes to the book in this category. Next on the comparison to-do list is my general critique of each one separately. I really enjoyed the book. I thought it was an adorable story and I was pleased to see that one of my favorite aspects from the movie, the 90s movie, <laughs> came from the book, which was how both children are utterly horrible, spoiled, and rotten, and it's because they can recognize that fact in others that they start to recognize it in themselves and can change and become better little humans. I did end up mentally comparing the book to the 90s version as I was reading it the entire time, but because that version followed the book so well, I think it helped me appreciate it more. Um, I will say though, Reading Yorkshire is really, really hard. Eh, it is greatly, he said. I'm 12 going on 13, and there's a lot of afternoons <laughs> in 13 years, but seems to me like I never seed one as greatly as this ear. Air, ear, air. Aye, it is a greatly, great, greatly? Shit. Greatly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Aye, it is a gradely one, said Mary, and she sighed for mere joy. I'll warrant it's the... There's no E. Does the think, said Colin with dreamy carefulness, as happen it was made loike this ear all o' purpose for me? That there is a bit of good Yorkshire. I doubt anybody is saying that about this. Third sheep and first rate. That's the art. That was not a lot. That was not a lot that I did. That was, that was, yeah, I can't. And I apologize to anyone in Yorkshire. I can't read it. It's hard. And it became this point of the kids bonding with one another that Mary and Colin learned to speak Yorkshire, so it happened more frequently. Nostalgia reigns supreme. There's really nothing negative that I can say because of that. <laughs> I think both the little girl and the boy did a good job, and I love Maggie Smith. It's just awesome. 
dude. <laughs> I was so excited when I heard they were redoing this movie, and then I saw the trailer. Obviously stoked about Colin Firth and Julie Waters, but I could already tell that it was a Hollywood adaptation, which I don't hide. It's my least favorite type of adaptation. So it should be no surprise that this point goes to my childhood. I mean, the 90s version of the movie. Spoiler time! Let's break this down beat by beat. The book introduction is so depressing. Burnett, Hodgson Burnett? Burnett. The author <laughs> did an excellent job of making me care about this spoiled little brat because you're learning about how awful she is because basically her parents didn't want her and told the servants to do whatever to keep her quiet and then there is a cholera outbreak and the parents die and no one else gives a shit about spoiled little Mary. <laughs> Expertly done. Mostly similar to the book, I think, but a cholera outbreak isn't nearly as exciting as having everyone but Mary die a fiery death in an earthquake. But the point about Mary being an unloved sourpuss who doesn't do anything for herself at all still comes across. This is, this is painful. Like, like Percy Jackson, Artemis Fowl, he stated calmly, kind of painful. <laughs> First, they shifted the timeline. The book was written in 1911, but this movie takes place in 1947, presumably so they can take advantage of the real Indo-Pakistani war that broke out. Because neither a cholera outbreak nor a crushing firestorm is as exciting as real history. So that was honestly fine, like whatever. But second, Mary is described as a dull, disagreeable looking creature who doesn't have much of an imagination. When we meet her here, she's obviously scared from the gunfire and shouting that she hears, and then tells her dolly a story using fancy puppets to create shadows on the wall. And then we find out her parents still die of cholera. So you still want to like her and feel for her, but she doesn't come off as a nasty little ankle biter anymore. My point goes to the book. I think the intro is masterfully done. On her way to her uncle back in England, she stays with a family that has five kids about her age, and it's the first time she's had to deal with other children. Being very self-absorbed and stuck up, they don't get along, and she earns the nickname Mistress Mary Quite Contrary from the nursery rhyme. As she continues on her journey, she starts to notice the difference between the, her relationship with her parents and the relationship she sees other children having with their parents. You know, the loving kind. And it gets her thinking. Rather than showing the various stops along the way, Mary just shows up in England six months later with a bunch of other kids on a steamboat, and you hear the nasty whispers of the other kids about how sour she is. Since we can't hear the thoughts of movie characters, we just see all the happy parents and guardians picking up their children. And then Mary's name is called. And called. And the kids sing Mistress Mary nursery rhyme and laugh at her while no one picks her up, and she can see the relationship difference in their circumstances. Here the message is totally different. She instead faces the loss of her childhood when another boy who's also waiting to board the steamboat says he doesn't want to hear one of her stories because he's not a little kid anymore. This hurts Mary who was admittedly rude to him like two seconds ago and so she throws her doll Jemima off the docks and into the sea and tears fall as Jemima floats away. Point to the 90s version, the contrast between the other children and their caring families and Mary being the last one left hours later was well done. Devastating, but well done. <laughs> at Misslethwaite Manor at last, Mary's world is turned upside down as she has to learn to do crazy things like dress herself and jump rope. She's given free range of the grounds while she's basically forgotten again and notices the manor makes strange crying noises at night. She befriends a robin who shows her the key and the way to the secret garden, and her general attitude changes. She's still snobby, but becoming more agreeable. She asks Dickon for help in the secret garden, and when she finally meets her uncle, she asks for a bit of earth to call her own, but conveniently doesn't say where. It's basically the same, but with a bit more of Mary snooping around inside before she was kicked outside. She found the key in the late Mrs. Craven's room, which I thought was a little bit more believable than a robin showing her where it was buried. 
Mary also meets Colin before she meets her uncle, but still craftily asks permission to tend to the secret garden. In this version, Mary meets a dog whom she names after her discarded doll, Jemima. The dog lives in the secret garden and that's how Mary finds out about it. We see flashbacks to her childhood where she had a loving father but a neglectful mother. She meets Colin very quickly and Master Craven before she discovers the secret garden fully so she doesn't ask for Earth but instead to play outside. Master Craven also doesn't travel much like in the other versions, instead dealing with the loss of his wife by getting rid of everything in the house that reminds him of her which is like everything. For me, point to the book. I liked the way they described her in her new surroundings and getting the feel of things. Mary doesn't spend much time with her cousin Colin at first, mostly Dickon as they fix up the garden, but eventually they get him out in the garden and he begins to get better. They attribute it to magic, which is adorable, and in the following months, the magic made the garden come to life and healed Colin, and he decided he would live forever and make a scientific discovery of all the magic that happens in the world. Mary and Colin seem to spend more time together in this version of the movie, but they still keep his physical progress a secret. And my favorite scene is Colin having a fit and Mary yelling back at him, but then they defend each other from the evil adults who come in and try to break them up. I don't know why I like it so much, but I do. No mention of scientific discoveries yet, but they do recognize the magic of the garden and within themselves. The garden is already alive and thriving and huge. It's huge. <sighs> Mary bonds with Dickon over healing the dog whose foot got stuck in a trap on the moor. Convinced of the actual magic of the garden, Mary and Dickon basically kidnap Colin and force him outside in the garden in secret. During Mary's wanderings, she had found her aunt's rooms and took a pearl necklace and the discovery of this thievery gets her locked up and sent to boarding school. Mary, however, escapes her locked room and brings Colin back into the garden again to cure him. Only this time she brings him to the place where his mother died. He's upset and he asks to leave and the garden turns gray behind him, sharing in his sadness. Point to the 90s movie version, but I already said that it included one of my favorite scenes, so that really shouldn't be a surprise. Master Craven, who is really a superb absentee father, suddenly gets this intense feeling that he has to go home and see his son. This was, of course, the exact moment when Colin declared that he was going to live forever. At home, he learns that his son is actually outside, and on his way into the garden, Colin literally runs into his dad. They show him around the garden, and they all live happily ever after. Sadly, the only mention of making great discoveries is a strange ritual they perform to bring Daddy Dearest home, which results in a strange dream Master Craven has that does indeed bring him home. This time, when he wanders into the garden, he sees Colin walking around playing Marco Polo and surprises him that way. He and Colin tour the garden, and Mary feels sad and forgotten again, but then they remember her and they include her as they all dance in a circle and celebrate life and magic. Mary finds letters that her mother wrote to her aunt and goes to show Colin. He walks to the door to see them and then seems surprised that he's walking. He, Mary, and Dickon go back into the garden and read the letters. Happy again, the garden looks beautiful. While out in the garden, the manor catches fire and Mary goes back inside knowing that Master Craven would be searching for Colin. She tells her uncle that Colin is in the garden and helps him outside with the assistance of his late wife's spirit, which they can both apparently see. Mary's mother is also there, and after reading the letters, she finally understands her mom and her grief. Master Craven goes to the garden and calls for his son, who walks to meet him. My point goes to the book. I always felt the dancing scene at the end of the 90s version was a little weird because they totally left out Dickon, and I felt bad. Speaking of feeling badly, here's the final tally of the points. The book gets four, the 90s movie version also gets four, and the 20s movie version is still stuck at negative one. I've never had a tie before. Should we play it like soccer or hockey and allow ties, or should I figure out a tiebreaker and decide once and for all who's the winner, like football or tennis? Hit me up with suggestions and I'll mull them over. For now though, that's a wrap. 
Francis Hodgson. <laughs> We're off to a great start. Vart Shapin. <laughs> I am so insulting. Because this is a nasty little ankle biter. Ankle biter. That's why I can't say it. I didn't write it properly. I feel like I missed something. Time will tell.